Our universe will be white like a clinic, silent like a mortuary. This is the century of nightmares, idealisms, I hate you. We are eloquent like a brothel keeper giving sermons. Our great idea is that morals and justice are always on our side. It is for the good cause. What we do, what our allies do, these are never atrocities. But as soon as a regime is our adversary, atrocities sprout up around it, like nettles in a garden. Justice has from now on disappeared from our world. International law is not only an equivocal law, it is finally, such as it is applied today, the negation and destruction of all law. From now on, this conscience which is clear about its duty is no more. The order of the sovereign is deposed from its absolute power, the indisputable, the certain is abolished everywhere, the edict placed on the wall no longer has any authority, obedience to the magistrate is a matter of circumstance, it is no more permitted to anyone to say the law is the law, the king is the king. All that enabled us to die tranquil is undercut by these absurd sentences. The state no more has a form. The city no more has walls. The new sovereign, without a capital and without a face, reigns in their place from now on. Its tabernacle is a radio. It is there that one hears each evening the voice to which we owe obedience, that of the superstate, which has primacy over the fatherland. The fatherlands are deposed. They are deposed for the benefit of a spiritual empire of the world, which has precedence, as they say, over all the fatherlands. They reinvented Rome. There is from now on, there is officially since the judgment of Nuremberg, a religion of humanity. And there is also a Catholicism of humanity. We owe submission to the very holy church of humanity, which has bombers for missionaries. From now on, the conclave pronounces and the scepters fall. We enter the history of the holy empire. The truth basis for the Nuremberg trial, the one which no one has ever dared to point out, is, I suspect, not fear. It is the spectacle of the ruins. It is the panic of the victors. It is necessary that the others be in the wrong. It is necessary, for if by chance they had not been monsters, how would the victors bear the weight of all of those destroyed cities and all those thousands of phosphorus bombs? It is the horror, it is the despair of the victors which is the true motive for the trial. They have veiled their faces before what they were forced to do, to give themselves courage. They transformed their massacres into a crusade. They invented a right to massacre in the name of respect for humanity. Being killers, they promoted themselves to policemen. The world is from now on democratic for perpetuity. It is democratic by judicial decision. From now on, a legal precedent weighs down on every sort of national rebirth. This is infinitely serious. For actually, every party is by definition a plot or concerted plan. Since every party is an association of men who propose to seize power and to apply their plan, which they call a program, or at least to apply most of this plan. Every national resurrection, every policy of energy or simply of cleanliness is thus struck with suspicion. They have twisted our consciences and now they look at us limp. The superstate does not exist, but the vetoes of the superstate do exist. They are in the verdict of Nuremberg. The superstate does the evil which it can do before being able to render services. The evil which it can do is disarm us against everything, against its enemies, as well as against our own. It is the foundation of their law. They condemn your truth. They declare it radically wrong. They condemn our feeling our roots, even our most profound ways of seeing and feeling. They explain to us why our brain is not made as it should be. We have the brain of barbarians. No one has any more the right to sit down in his field and say, this ground belongs to me. No one has any more the right to stand up in the city and say, we are the old ones. We built the houses of this city 
Anyone who does not want to obey our laws should get out. It is written now that a council of impalpable beings has the capacity to know what occurs in our houses and our cities. Crimes against humanity. This law is good, this one is not good. Civilization has the right to veto. We lived up to now in a solid universe whose generations had deposited stratifications one after the other. All was clear. The father was the father. The law was the law. The foreigner was the foreigner. One had the right to say that the law was hard, but it was the law. Today these sure bases of political life are anatomy. For these truths constitute the program of a racist party condemned at the court of humanity. Thus we defend and respect the human person, but an ideal human person, a human person in abstracto, a human person in the sense understood by the court. This quite naked human person, who does not have a fatherland, and who is indifferent to any fatherland, who does not know the laws of the city and the order of the city, but who perceives with a very personal instinct the international vice of the universal conscience. This new man, this dehydrated man, it is he whom I do not recognize. Your universal conscience protects a hothouse plant. This theoretical product has no more relationship to a man than a Californian orange wrapped in cellophane and transported across continents has to an orange on a tree. When we think of a human person, we see a father with his children around him, with his children around his table, in a room on his farm, and he shares soup and bread with them, or in a house in the suburbs, and there is nowhere he's so well off as on his farm, or in his fourth floor apartment, or in his house in the suburbs, and he returns from work and he asks, what happened that day? It is this human person whom we defend and respect, this human person and no other, and all that belongs to him, his children, his house, his work, his field, and we say that this human person has the right that his children's bread be assured, that his work be honored, that his field belong to him, that his children's bread be assured. That means that a Negro, an Asian, or a Semite will not dispute with him about the place to which he has the right inside the city, and that he will not be obliged someday in order to live to be the proletarian and the slave of a foreigner. He will be able to think what he wants and say what he wants, and he will be the master at his table and the master in his house, that he will be protected if he obeys the edicts of the prince, and that the Negro, the Asian and the Semite will not appear in front of his door to explain to him what it is necessary to think. That his work be honored that means that he will meet with the men of his trade, those whom he calls his partners or his colleagues as he wants, and that he will have the right to say that his work is hard, that the chair which he is making is worth so many pounds of bread, that each hour of his work is worth the pounds of bread, that he has the right also to live, that is not to wear worn out shoes and torn clothing, to have his own radio if he so desires to have his own house if he puts money aside for that, his own car if he succeeds in his work, the share of luxury that our machines owe him, and that the Negro, the Asian or the Semite will not fix at Winnipeg or Pretoria the price of his day's work and the menu at his table, and that his field belong to him. That means that he has the right to call himself the master of his house which his grandfather built master of his city which his grandfather and those of the other men of the city built, that no one has the right to drive him out of his residence or out of the council house, and that the foreign workmen whose grandfathers were not there when they built the belfry, the Negroes, the Asians and the Semites, who work in the mine or who sell at the crossroads, will not have the power to decide the destiny of his little boy. That is what we call the rights of the human person, and we say that the duty of the sovereign is nothing other than to ensure respect for these essential rights, and to manage his nation well, like a good father of a family.
The man of the earth and the cities, this man who has been man as long as there has been people and cities, it is precisely he that Nuremberg condemns and repudiates. For the new law says to him, you will be a citizen of the world. You yourself will also be packaged and dehydrated. You will not listen anymore to the rustle of your trees and the voice of your bells. Shake the dirt from your shoes, peasant. This land is nothing anymore. Modern times have come. Listen to the voice of modern times. The migrant labourer is the same man as you. The Jewish raghawker is the same man as you. They have the same rights as you on your land and on your city. Respect the negro or peasant. They have the same rights as you and you will set places for them at your table and they will enter into the council where they will teach you what the universal conscience says which you do not yet hear as well as you should and their sons will be respected men and they will be established as judges over your sons they will govern your city and they will buy your field for the universal conscience gives them expressly all these rights as for you peasant if you meet with your friends and long for the time when you saw only local boys at the city fair, know that you were opposing the universal conscience and that the law does not protect you against that. For such in truth is the position of man after the demotion of fatherlands. For we already foresee that these new ethics refer to a strange universe a universe with something sick about it, an elastic universe where our eyes no longer recognize things, but a universe which is that of others, precisely that of which Bernanus had a presentiment when he feared that one day the dreams locked up in the sly brain of a small negro shoeshiner in a New York ghetto would come true. We are there, our minds are doped, we have been struck by Circa. We have all become Jewish. There are no more borders. There are no more cities. From one end to the other of the continent, the laws are the same. And also the passports, and also the judges, and also the currencies. Only one police force and only one brain the senator from Milwaukee inspects and decides, in return for which, trade is free. At last, trade is free. We plant some carrots which by chance never sell well, and we buy some hoeing machines, which always happen to be very expensive. And we are free to protest, free, infinitely free to write, to vote, to speak in public, Provided that we never take measures which can change all that. One does not know very well where our freedom ends. Where our nationality ends. One does not know very well where what is permitted ends. It is an elastic universe. One does not know any more where one's feet are set. One does not even know any more if one has feet. One feels very light as if one's body had been lost. But for those who grant us this simple ablation, what infinite rewards, what a multitude of tips. This universe which they polish up and try to make look good to us is similar to some palace in Atlantis. There are everywhere some glasswares, columns of false marble, inscriptions, magic fruits, but entering this palace, you abdicate your power. In exchange, you have the right to touch the golden apple or read the inscription. You are nothing anymore. You do not feel anymore the weight of your body. You have ceased to be a man. You are one of the faithful of the religion of humanity. At the bottom of the sanctuary, there sits a Negro God. You have all the rights except to speak evil to the God. We can get within a couple of hundred yards of it. There's a hog back off the left. 
How many you figure? About a dozen each. Enough to go around. <laughs> 